All right, so let's open our Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 3, please. So we continue our verse by verse study. Revelation chapter 3, as we come into the middle of the letter from Jesus to the church there in Laodicea. We'll be looking at verses 17 through 19 this morning. Oh, and by the way, uh, the projector, the slides aren't, weren't done this week, so we have to do it the old-fashioned way and turn on our Bibles. Uh, so we'll be doing that some here. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 17. And we'll be looking at verse through verses 19, 17 through 19. Let's read it and then we'll pray. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Let's pray. Father, as we come once again to your word, Lord, I pray that you'd make each one of our hearts keen, alive by your Holy Spirit to hear what is being taught this morning. Lord, that you would have your way in our lives, that you would take us all deeper no matter where we are, those watching, listening as well. And Lord, I pray that you'd anoint us afresh even now with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, we come to the letter here addressed uh, from Jesus to the church in Laodicea is the Apostle John there on the island of Patmos is basically dictate, Jesus is dictating to him uh, these letters to send out to the seven churches uh, in Asia Minor, or seven of the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, And we're on the last letter. um, And we see here that we started last week that Uh, You know, the church there in Laodicea was receiving a severe yet loving letter of rebuke from Jesus. And if you'll notice back in verses 15 and 16 with me, it says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This was a church that was full of lukewarm people in their faith. They were not cold. They hadn't rejected Jesus Christ, but they weren't hot and on fire for Jesus Christ either. Uh, We might call it today the religious church. Those who are simply being religious. And we can all be religious. We can all come and sing a song. We can all stand and sit. Everybody here able to stand and sit and, you know, look religious. At church I used to go to, we'd have kneelers and they'd tell you when to kneel, when to, what to sing. And that's basically what's happening here. So they're not hot. They're not cold, uh, but they're comfortable and relaxed, though, uh, in their false profession of faith, if you will. Uh, And so uh, they basically had become the wicked and lazy servants that Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 25 that we looked at last week. Uh, The the one with the talents that instead of using the talents that God had given him, he buried them. And if you remember this, the servant said, well, I was afraid uh, because you're, you know, you reap where you haven't sowed and done all this stuff. And, and, And the master corrects him and said, no, no, you wicked and lazy servant. And so that's where the church was. They were trusting in their riches um, and uh, resting even in their spiritual riches, if you will, like we'll see in just a moment. Now, two quick things to note. Uh, What we just mentioned there in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, Jesus was talking about uh, things of the last days. Very interesting to put that in the things of the last days. Um, And then here in our letter this morning, again, we noted last week, Uh, that this letter is also prophetically seen um, as being to the church in the latter days, at least a part of the church, I'd say the majority of the church, that is falling away 
uh, the falling away that Jesus spoke of that Paul mentioned a few times and even describes in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, but that letter, what we looked at last time, the letter to Philadelphia, that church was remaining faithful. Even though they were weary, they were still holding on to the word of God. They still would not deny the name of Jesus. Yet here now in this church, they were lukewarm. And as we just read a moment ago, he would vomit them from his mouth. One commentator said uh, there were some churches that Jesus wrote to uh, that made him angry. Others that he wrote to that made him sad. And then this church basically makes him want to throw up, makes him sick. And so again, we see this. It's very interesting to look at. Um, but as we come here into verse 17, we see the reason for their being lukewarm. Check it out. Verse 17 says, Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Uh, let me read this out of a few different versions. The New Living says, You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. A uh, paraphrase says, you brag, I'm rich, I've got it made, and I had need from nothing from anyone. And then the Greek scholar Wiest said it this way in his expanded New Testament. He says, because you are saying I am wealthy in this world's goods and have gotten spiritual riches and have need of not even one thing. So you see there's a slight difference there in the Greek talking about, you know, they, they're saying they're wealthy, but they're also uh, you know, full of spiritual riches as well. They didn't think they had any need to want to grow spiritually. And basically, that's how we can spot lukewarmness in the church today or even within ourselves. First, you know, we're those who think that we have, you know, so much of this world's goods that we're doing well. And secondly, uh, that we think that we don't need to grow any more spiritually. We've got it covered. And so Jesus once said, if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 10, please. As we are talking about Laodicea, trusting in their riches, their physical riches, their spiritual knowledge. Mark chapter 10. Jesus had something to say about the rich. Most of us know this scripture. Mark 10, verses 23 through 27. Mark 10, verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter their kingdom. Notice he goes deeper. Not just love their riches, but trust their riches. Verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Praise God for that, amen. Amen. Now, it's interesting because Jesus points it out here in, in Mark. He, he, he says, look, those who trust in riches, it's harder for them to enter, you know, you know through an eye, go through an eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom of God. And so when you have riches, when you have wealth, there comes along with it the danger of basically resting in that wealth, finding security in that wealth. Now, most of us here, I don't think if I asked how many people here are rich, I don't think most people would raise your hands. Even if you were rich, you wouldn't probably want to raise your hands because we'd all be coming to you and saying, hi, I'd like a new car, please. <laughs> At least I would. I don't know about, no, just kidding. But uh, most of us would say, dude, I'm, bar I'm barely making that mouth. You know, I, we make it month to month, week to week. I, I, I sure wouldn't consider myself rich. But you see, how many people here live in the United States, if you don't mind me raising your hand? Most of us here, right? We're living here in the United States. So if you just raised your hand, or if you live here in the United States, you are richer than 95% of the world. You are rich. You're rich. 
well, I'm not Bill Gates, so I'm not, you know, anything. You're rich compared to 95% of the world. Thus, like it or not, we here this morning, those watching or listening, look, we have to pay extra special attention to these words here this morning because we live in a wealthy country. We live in a country that we're going to look at in just a moment. But again, it can become so easy to be lukewarm basically when we're doing okay in our lives. Notice I'm not saying we're doing great. We're not doing, sometimes we do great, sometimes we do terrible. But man, it's easy to go lukewarm in a place that we're living in. When we have a place to go at night, where we have a place to go at night and, and lay our heads on a pillow, we have food on the table, clothes on our backs. Most of us have closets full of clothes. We have little or no health issues, or if we do, there's all the different doctors we can go to even for free. We go to our faucet and have fresh, clean drinking water that we can clean, turn on. We flip a switch, the lights go on, we turn another switch when we're too warm and want to be cool or we're too cold and we want to become warm. If we run out of money, we can go on the streets and beg for money. We can go to a food bank. Anyone now in America and in most first world countries have immediate access to free food, free clothing, free medical care, free housing. And here in the United States, you can even get a free cell phone. Now, I'm not saying that these places are perfect, but compared to 95% of the world, we are the rich ones. You see, even today, 95% of the world doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. 95% of the world doesn't know when their next, and they can't go on the streets and beg because they're just begging from other beggars. They have no food banks or churches or governments to turn to. Parents worry every single day if their children will die from malnutrition, malaria, dehydration, or any other such thing. They live in a shack or a lean-to trying to stay out of the freezing rain or out of the burning hot sun. Most have little to no clothing. And amazingly, the vast majority has no access to health care and to doctors. When you look around the world, we are the rich ones. You know, I'll be honest with you. Most of us as Americans, we're kind of spoiled brats in that way. We're, we're like, we think a bad day is when we didn't get enough likes on our post on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Nobody watched my video. I don't have enough followers to become an influencer. And I'm not kidding. We have our young people that are killing themselves like never before. Not just young, by the way. Middle-aged. Uh, people in the armed forces, record numbers. You know why? And I, I say the, the, the reason why, it, it'd be great for every single person in America to go serve in a, in a third world country for a year. Just to go serve these people that are starving to death, try to help them and to see what it's really like in other countries where, where they don't have food, where they don't have fresh water. But you see, guys and gals, again, when we look around the world, we are the rich ones. So again, we need to be extra careful about what we're reading here today. We need to have those ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say. If we were in Africa today, and I had a bunch of African people, Sudanese sitting right here, and they're sitting on dirt floors, and they just came from a hut, this would be a completely different message, at least applicationally. But because we live in one of the richest, if not the richest countries in the world, we have to be careful about not saying, I am rich and I have become healthy and have need of nothing. Remember, we said it this way, because you are saying, I am wealthy in this world's goods and have gotten spiritual riches and have need not even of one thing. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, it can be quite easy on most days never to think about God. Let me explain what I'm saying. Unless we purpose to. Uh, I mean that most people, even I would dare say most people within the church only really think about God when they're in need. When they need something for themselves, someone else they love or care about. And if we're never mostly in physical need for the most part, then most of us just put God in the back seat most of the time. 
And we just go, Lord, you just hang out with me, dude. I'm going to go do what I'm going to do anyway. And just you kind of come along with me and do me a favor, the Lord, and bless everything I'm doing, right? We all say that, amen. But I'm not really going to pay attention to you. These are the lukewarm in their faith. You see, again, if we're honest with ourselves, it can be quite easy most days never to think about God unless we purpose ourselves to, unless you are on fire for Jesus Christ, you are hot in your faith, in love with him, then you can't stop thinking about him. Can I have an amen? Amen. 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 But you see, many here today, many watching or listening today, you hardly think about God until you need something. Even when you first wake up, Lord, just please bless this day. Go before me, do whatever I need you to do, Lord. Amen, hallelujah, praise Jesus. But remember, these are those that not are only putting their trust in physical riches, but he goes on, um, uh, we said that one part have gotten spiritual riches. And they basically think that even spiritually they don't need anything else. I remember Tilly and I were blessed to be on staff at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa with Pastor Chuck, many, many years, and, and I'll be honest, it was awesome. I'd come from starving in a church spiritually, no word, to all of a sudden just becoming, you know, uh, you think I'm heavy now, you should see, see me spiritually. I was like, Fat Albert, man, it was awesome. And I say that in an awesome way. And, and in Orange County, uh, you know, Tali and I, we, because of the radio stations, all the different Calvary chapels and other, you know, churches, it was awesome. Tali and I called it the, you know, spiritual Disneyland. Uh, because that's what it was like. It, became, it kind of became kind of grotesque in a way, though, because all of a sudden, it, a lot of it changed, and, and all of a sudden, it was about the celebrity pastors and who, who had a church of 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 more, and who is the better, you know, or celebrity worship leaders, and let's get them all, and that's when, the, oh, let's go hear this person, let's go hear, instead of about Jesus. That's the lukewarm. You see, the lukewarm think that they are fine spiritually. They don't think they need to grow. They don't think they need to, to do the things that are spiritual to keep growing. You see, they said a prayer one time in their, you know, when they were eight years old or when they were 18 or when they're 80. And by the way, praise God for that. But was there change? Were you born again of the Spirit of God? Is there continued change? You see, and I think also that it's because we live in a country that has tried to embrace Judeo-Christian values, that most believe that they're Christian. You, you hear people, you know, the polls, and it is going down, by the way, but, you know, 70-plus percent claim to be Christians in the United States. Many have been grown, been grown up in, in Christian families, and they think, well, because mom and dad are Christian, of course I'm Christian. I'm Washingtonian, I'm United, I'm, you know, U.S. citizen, and I'm a Christian. Uh, no. Have we repented of our sins and believed in Jesus Christ to be the Lord and our Savior? Is there a new life? You see, the lukewarm think of themselves that they are doing great spiritually. They see no need in their life for change. They say to themselves, I don't need to read my Bible every day. I've got it covered. They say, I don't need to obey what I'm reading in my Bible. I'm covered by grace. They say, I pray. I don't need to pray every day in a prayer closet. After all, I'm doing pretty good. They say, I don't need to fast here and there. I'm okay spiritually. They say, I don't need to serve. In fact, they're lucky to have me at church. And they should be happy to serve me, by the way. They say, I don't need to tithe. Sheesh, so legalistic. I should just be able to come and mooch off everybody else's giving. Because again, they're lucky to have me. You know, it's interesting when you talk about um, fa uh, fasting. Jesus said, when you fast. He didn't say, when you feel like fasting. He says, or if you ever get around to fasting, he said, when you fast. But I'll guarantee you that if we went around and took a poll that most people here probably have never fasted in your life. And you've heard it many times if you've come to this church at all. You've heard me talk about those scriptures. We've even taught about them. But you don't. Why not? Because you're lukewarm. Just going to say it flat out. You're lukewarm in your faith. If you're not serving, even, you know, with the giving. What are you talking about? I put 20 bucks in the plate. 
dude, keep your 20 bucks. You obviously need it more than we do. Who cares? I, I don't care personally what you give. We're not looking to buy gold handles for the doors. I'm not looking for a Mercedes Benz. But I am looking for you to grow spiritually, to want to grow and when we have these hearts that don't care if we're doing these things, if you are here this morning and this is you, you are lukewarm in your faith. Hear this. I am not saying you're not saved and you need to, you know, as far as you need to do this to get saved. I'm not saying you need to do these things to get saved. But once you are saved, it becomes natural because you've been born again of the Spirit of God. If I go to the, the, the river or a lake and there's fish in there, I don't have to say, hey, fish, you guys want to stay in the water? Or if I take the fish out, what does it want to do? It, it longs to get back in the water. Why? Because it's made for the water. The Christian who has been born again of the Spirit of God longs to be in the Word of God, longs to obey the Word of God, longs to fast and to be on our knees in our prayer closet with our Jesus, to be serving and to give to be witnessing. That is a Christian who is on fire and has been born again. If you don't care and you're here today, I beg you, get born again. Time is short. Now, whether that means I flop over tomorrow or you do, or Jesus Christ comes, stop pretending, please. Stop being religious. Because these things, I read these things, you're hearing me and you go, all right, Pastor Bill, you got me. I give in. I'm going to fast this week. All right, I'll just, all right, does that make you happy? No, it doesn't. You see, because you're looking at this list, uh, me and Pastor Jay have called it this before. You're looking at this list as a list of got to's. You see, for the one who's a Christian, the fish in the water, these are get to's. I, I long to spend time with my Jesus. And I can't wait one day to fall down at his feet in his presence just to worship, to kiss his feet. And, and, and again, it, it, as, as a Christian, all these things that we're doing because of love. I want to serve because I love God, but I also love his people. I, I want to give because I love God and I just want to praise him. He's given me everything. I want to fast and pray and read and obey the word because I am his now. I'm his disciple. Gladly so. But again, not so the lukewarm Christian who may not be Christian at all. And again, it's obvious it's, they're oblivious to the state they're in because they're religious. And I know there are some here today, some watching and listening. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, many will come to me on that day and they'll say, Lord, haven't I done this in your name? Haven't I done that in your name? I remember teaching this years and years ago and, and it woke me up. I'd rather take everybody, I'd rather have people come into heaven than people come into this church. If this message offends you, it's not me who's offending you, it's Jesus himself that's offending you. And good, get offended. You ever heard a pastor tell you that? Get offended. I don't care if you never come back, not in the way you think. Get offended and get saved. Walk out those doors, go to another church, but get saved. Repent of your sins. Believe on Jesus Christ. By the way, I don't really want you to leave. You know, just so you know, we love you. But my point is, it's not about filling the seats here, it's about filling heaven. And that should be our hearts too. Let's take as many of the world as we can with us. And if we, you know, a lot of times we might just be planting seeds. We might just be watering. Sometimes we can partake of the harvest. But be seed planters. Be waterers out in this world that needs it. Wake up. I don't want anyone here to go to hell. That's why I get so passionate. Pastor Bill, what do you have a heart for? I was asked this year. It used to be the thing. Gary will remember this too. They'd come to your church and they'd say, hey, what's your heart? What's the drive for your ministry? Is it for the homeless? Is it for the young people? Uh, you know, and there's churches here that started in, I don't know if you, they were, you know, you had to be under 30 years old or you couldn't come to the church. Now they're all in their 40s. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but... 
they'd ask me, and it's like, is it for the homeless? Is it for the prisons? Is it for what is it? I go, where's E all the above? But my main passion is for people within the church to get saved, to be deepened in their faith, to grow in their faith in Jesus Christ and become spiritual giants in Jesus. And by the way, that means little bitty people compared to the Lord, humbling ourselves before the Lord that he might raise us up. Look, lukewarm Christian, again, the one who may not Christian at all, be Christian at all, they think that they're well off physically, so they're comfortable for the most part, uh, and yet they're, and in their minds they're off spiritually too. So again, they don't have need of anything. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the one who doesn't read their Bible every day. That's the one who's not doing these spiritual disciplines because, oh, those are legalistic, you know. No, it's just how we get in spiritual shape. It's just things that God told us to do himself. Again, not to get saved, not to, be, to keep our salvation, but now because we are saved. These are the things we do to grow. Now notice, look at verse 17 as Jesus continues. He says, they don't even know. They, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. How many people here this morning, you think you're great spiritually, but in reality, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. There's no love in your life. No love in your life for the Lord. No love in your life for the lost. No love in your life uh, for the, the people sitting around you, the Christians. You know, we can tell that if we just run out the door right after service ends. You don't have anybody here you want to get to know or to pray with to take out to lunch, to minister to. And by the way, the beautiful part is when you do that, the Lord always finds a way to minister to you too. You can never outgive the Lord. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. A, par a, par a few fair paraphrases say it this way. You're oblivious to the fact that you're pitiful, blind, beggar, threadbare, and homeless. And you're not conscious of your sad and unhappy condition that you are poor and blind and without clothing. One last paraphrase says it this way, but you don't know how bad off you are. You are poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. None so hard to minister to as a pastor as those who are proud. Uh, you, you, pride, you, you can't, hard, you, the Holy Spirit has to, to get through the pride. Because pride will stop us from repenting of so many other sins because that pride we have. Oh, I can never admit that I'm wrong. And they're blind. You see, again, we need to understand that there are many here today, many listening, watching. You think you're fine with the Lord, that God doesn't care about where you're at spiritually. Spiritually. You know, you go with once saved, always saved. It's all under grace now, so it doesn't matter. It does matter. He wants to sanctify you continually, conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Are you acting that way? Saddest thing in the world to me is when I meet an older person who says they've been a Christian for a long time, but they're the grumpiest person I've ever met. No love for their wife or for their husband or their kids or whatever. What happened to you? Were you ever truly saved at all or has it been religion the whole time? God cares about our spirituality. That's why Jesus died. So that he could save us, not our bodies, but our souls. Perhaps you've been blinded by your love for the things of this world. Comforts relaxations again. That's what, you know, Americas do, don't we? We relax, have it your way. Go to Burger King. Perhaps you're blinded by the cares and concerns and fears of this world. Perhaps you have been deeply hurt or wounded in some way, and yet you're staying there. Perhaps you've been misled by the false teachings on grace even within the church. And by the way, there are many false teachings on grace within the church. I know some who don't seem to believe that. Oh, you can never teach falsely about grace. Of course you can. We have to go with what the Bible says. Perhaps you've been a professing Christian for a long time and you're just weary, yet you're no longer walking strongly. You're on fire with Jesus Christ, so now you instead have become lazy and burying your talents away. The lukewarm not even realizing that this is you. Look, we can all become 
caught up in the things of the world, the good stuff, right? We can all be hurt uh, and deeply wounded, everyone here. We can all have fears and concerns, boy, especially in these days. But you know what? We don't stay there, do we? No, because we're Christian, and as we are in the Word of God, we're reminded of the faithfulness of God, that He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's working all things together for good to those who love Him, and those are called according to His purpose, that He will keep those in in peace whose minds are stayed upon Him because they trust in Him. Why do I have these scriptures memorized? Because I get that way just like anybody else. But then we come back to who our Jesus is, and He picks us up. It's like, okay, Bill, you've fallen. Now it's time to get up. Now, what does Jesus say about this? Look at verse 18. What's his counsel to, to, to fix this? He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. So the first he tells us to buy from him gold refined in the fire. Now, he's not saying, basically, he's not saying this. He's not saying, go sell all your regular gold and then just go give it to Pastor Bill, you know, and and buy indulgences from your pastor, which some churches have taught over the years. No, no, no. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 6. We'll see exactly what Jesus is talking about here. This is all spiritual. But by the way, the spiritual will always affect our physical, won't it? If I don't care about these things, if I'm not caught up in these things, then the Lord will use us in different radical ways. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus speaking, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Stop trusting in America. Stop trusting in your retirement plans or your work or your health. Trust in Jesus. Put, buy your gold there in, in heaven. Do the things what God says. You see, when we buy gold from this world, the stuff of this world, it's actually fool's gold. It's it's worth nothing. May we instead store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Remember, because for where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. Now, so secondly, so first to to buy from him gold refined uh, from by him. Secondly, uh, we're to buy from Jesus. Notice he says, white garments that you may be clothed. You see, the lukewarm one thinks that they are clothed in Jesus, but in fact, they're spiritually naked. It's interesting to me how most people uh, who are uh, lukewarm, they think that nobody can tell they're lukewarm. I'll be honest, I can tell usually within a few minutes of talking to somebody if they're lukewarm or not. How do I tell? I usually tell just by what they're talking about. What do you want to talk about? Dude, I want to talk about Jesus. Dude, I was reading this morning, let me tell you. And then he did this over here, so radical. The other's like, well, let me tell you about work. You know, it's so awesome. What's happening. Did you see the football game? Did you see what's going on in the baseball thing? Did you, you know, did you see that killer sale? What about that TikTok star, man? Have you seen that TikTok yet? You see, they're spiritually naked and they don't even know it. Their wives could tell you they're spiritually naked. Their husbands could tell you they're spiritually naked. Their kids could say it or the parents could say it about the kids. They've become the emperor with no clothes on. They trust not in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that leads them to abundant spiritual life or fruits in their lives. They instead are clothed with their own self-indulgence. Remember that servant that Jesus talked about. Remember they lied to themselves. Well, again, it's the, I'm afraid. No, no, no. You're you're wicked and you're lazy. That's the slothful servant. No, Jesus said instead buy clothes from him. Made white as snow through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
we put on his righteousness, then our spiritual nakedness, Jesus says, will no longer be visible. As we put off the old man, put off the old woman, daily denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following Jesus, people will see us clothed in him because it's real. It's not just religious. It's because we've been born again of his spirit. And some people will hate us because of it. They're going to see that you're after Jesus and they're going to hate you. Well, I haven't done anything to you. Why are you so mad at me? If you've never had that happen to you, get on fire for Jesus. Because it's not you they hate. They hate your master. And they're going to hate the servants even more so, Jesus said. They will see as we're putting on the cloaks of Jesus and his righteousness. They'll see by our words. They'll see by our actions. They'll see by our dying to ourselves as we're continually clothed in the conscious righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're clothed consciously. Put on that breastplate of righteousness. And by the way, as we do this, he then will receive all the glory. Because people will see your good works and say, oh, that can't be them. <laughs> that has to be God, their father. Now, third and lastly, Jesus said that they would anoint their eyes with salve that they might see. Hey, briefly, notice these are all things that we're to do. Sometimes we wait for that lightning from the cloud, you know, to, Lord, you just do it at night when I'm sleeping. But no, remember, uh, that these are things for us to do. Now notice, they're to, to, to anoint their eyes with salve that they might see. Remember the city of Laodicea. We talked about last week. It was known for its wool. And then it was also known uh, for its medicines and especially its eye salve. So again, the church there would have said, well, wait a minute. He's not talking about that physically. He's talking about spiritual. And what do we read in Psalm 23? It says, thou anointest my head with oil. Actually, the proper translation of the Hebrew there should say with an ointment. It's, it's actually an ointment that they put on the sheep. And uh, it's very interesting. And one of the reasons they'll put the ointment on their head, sometimes on their nose, even sometimes in their eyes, because all these bugs will come and they'll lay, you know, their larvae and eggs and all this stuff in their eyes and their snouts and other things of the sheep. And so they anoint the heads with oil so that they can now see. And even now this morning, maybe our eyes have been clogged up with the sins of this world, the temptations, the fears, and different things. But as the Holy Spirit comes and we put on the eye salve of the Word of God, see, that's what I believe he's talking about, the eye salve, the Holy Spirit, right? When we anoint somebody with oil, we're praying. It's just that it represents an anointing of the Spirit of God. And as we open the Word of God and he anoints our eyes and we can begin to see what's real, First and foremost, by the way, oh, not all the sin of everybody else out there, but the sin of this guy in the mirror. We all like to point out everybody else's sin, don't we? It makes us feel pretty good. Look at that guy over there. Whoa! Look at that gal, man. Boy, she's a buzzard. Look at me, Lord. I know I have a few little things. It's like, no, no, no. I died for all of you. All of your sins put me upon the cross. You see, and as the Lord anoints us with this oil, as we actually anoint ourselves, as we come and we, we become the saving faith in Jesus Christ, born again of the Spirit of God, His Holy Spirit anoints us. And as we read through the Word, we begin to see our eyes begin to be opened of the wretchedness of our sin, but of the glory of the grace of God. Yes, we are great sinners, but we have a greater God who can forgive us. Isn't that beautiful? This is good news. This is great news. That as God opens our eyes, he not only opens our eyes to the sins, but also to the promises that he's given us. The glory of who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do for us. As we open up the word of God and he opens up our eyes, we see the truth of his great forgiveness, his grace, his love, even towards us while we're yet sinners. And oh, how quickly the pride dissipates and humility takes its place. Oh, Lord, you're so good. Yes, I'm a saint, but Lord, I still have this flesh. Thank you for your continued forgiveness, your continued love. Now, notice as we're closing, Jesus says here at the end of verse 19, uh, he, he gives us the, his motive for saying this and then the cure. 
He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, he's quoting from Proverbs 3.12. And, you know, it's interesting to think that when God rebukes us, when God chastens us, it's because he loves us. How many people here, when you're a kid, you ever got in trouble? Raise your hand if you don't mind. Anybody ever got in trouble when you're a kid? How many of you enjoyed that? How many of you look forward to that? Never. And sadly, a lot of us still don't look forward to it with the Lord. I still don't. I'll be honest with you. I'm thankful for it. But it's still, I don't want to ever have him re rebuke me. I don't ever want to have him correct me. But we have to be careful and always remain open to that. Because as long as we're here on the earth, he's going to want to do this. Because why? Look at verse 19. Because he loves you. In America, we've come to this weird thing. I don't know if it was Dr. Spock or it was others through the years that, that oh, well, you know, you can't spank your kids, you can't discipline your kids because that shows you then you actually hate them. Well, they're going directly against the word of God. God says he disciplines those whom he loves. And by the way, just so we know, that means he disciplines in love, by the way. Be careful, moms and dads. Never discipline in anger. That's one of the biggest things, if I could tell you. Send your kid to the room for a little bit. You can cool down, go to prayer, get on your knees before the Lord. Never discipline in anger. God says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If this is you here this morning, and you feel the, 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 the Holy Spirit just right now convicting you, hear him because he loves you. Don't listen to me. Put me aside, but listen to God. Pastor Bill, you don't love us. You're kind of being harsh this morning. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't even care. If I didn't love you, I'd be like a lot of other pastors. I'd never mention sin. If I didn't love you, I'd be like a lot of other pastors and I would never mention repentance or hell. That's not love. Because then I'm just sending you on the way. <laughs> go on, go to hell. I love you but not like God loves you. God loves us. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And he ends, he says, therefore, be zealous and repent. It's not like, all right, Lord, I'll repent. I'm sorry, okay? No, dude, be zealous. Lord, I am so sorry. I can't, one of the things I seriously can't wait to do is fall at the feet of Jesus and just weep in repentance and in joy and in worship and in celebration. Look, guys and gals, our repentance needs to be zealous. Our repentance needs to be a godly repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, For I am glad now, not because you were pained, but because you were pained unto repentance, and so looked back to God. For you felt a grief such as God meant you to feel so that nothing you might suffer loss through us or harm what we did. For godly grief and pain of God is permitted to direct, produce a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil and it never brings regret. But worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristic of the pagan world is deadly, breeding and ending in death. And that's 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. Look, guys and gals, if this is you here this morning, maybe it's just an area in your life that you've let kind of grown just dead to the Lord. Today's the day of your salvation. Get saved. If you're just religious, get saved today. Come to Jesus. Confess your sins. Turn away from your sins. Believe on Jesus. Be the Lord and Savior of your life. That he rose from the dead on the third day. All the things that the, the scriptures tell us. And be born again of his spirit of God and enter into the joy of your salvation. He says, therefore, be zealous and repent. Amplified says, so be enthousi enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal and repent. Change your mind and attitude. I love how one paraphrase says it as we close. Up on your feet then, about face, run after God. Let's pray. Lord, as we read your word this morning and study it, Lord, I pray for your spirit, your anointing on everyone here, those watching or listening, Lord, that we would hear what you're saying by your spirit here, Lord. 
that we would hear these warnings and if any of us here is is in that place of being lukewarm lord we don't care about anything spiritual but we say we are spiritual lord would you convict us of that today and bring us back lord or maybe for the first time to true and saving grace and lord would you use us for your glory would you just use us in jesus name we pray amen